Hi, I'm George Dory, and welcome to our Coast to Coast AM YouTube channel. Have fun, tell your friends, and share us with everyone. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Coast to Coast AM's mobile app. And always remember to log on to our website at coasttocoastam.com for daily articles, the best paranormal information, and all you need to know about your favorite guests. And now you can become a Coast Insider directly through the Coast mobile app. We welcome our international listeners and even offer a free two-week trial. So don't delay. Become an insider today. We've got an eclectic mix of topics and guests tonight. A little of this and a little of that, and it should be fun. Prolific researcher and writer Cheryl Costa returns to share news about an amazingly ambitious project that she has unleashed. As some of you might remember, Cheryl and her spouse, Linda, are preeminent UFO statisticians. They've compiled the most comprehensive pile of hard data on UFO cases, sightings, incidents, breaking it all down by state, by county, by city, as well as into categories, shapes, sizes, time of day, all that kind of stuff. A bonanza of objective info on this strange subject. And now she's divvied it up into a series of books, one for each state in the country, so you can get info about UFOs that's darn near personalized. I mean, it's a good tool for local journalists or researchers who might want to jump into the subject. How and why did she crank out all of this work? All right, here we go. If you're into UFOs, truly into the subject, and are serious about wanting to understand the phenomena, hoping for more info, solid info, but you don't want to wait for the government to open up the vaults, as if that's ever going to happen, then this is for you. Cheryl Costa was named UFO Investigator of the Year back in 2018 at the International UFO Congress, and for very good reason. She and her partner, Linda, put together this humongous pile of UFO facts and figures, the ultimate desk reference for serious investigators and students of ufology. And it was minus many of the nasty catfights that typically characterize the subject all too often. Now, those two have taken a huge leap forward with a project that is astonishing in its scope. They've written books, UFO books, for each state filled with very specific data for each of the 50 states broken down into all kinds of categories the first 25 of those books are already out, and I think uh, Cheryl has said that there are five more coming every week until they get the whole 50 done. And Cheryl served in both the Air Force and Navy, worked in the defense industry as an information security professional, worked as a newspaper columnist as well with a wildly popular UFO column back in New York State, and she's also a playwright to boot. She joins us now to talk about how and why she put together this massive, still unfolding book series. Cheryl, welcome back. Hi, George. Nice to see you. I, uh, You know, there's a masochist lurking in there somewhere for you to take on something this monumental. I mean, 50 books, one for each state, uh, each yeah. one chock full of really fascinating numbers that help us understand this. What was going on? What's the inspiration for it? The inspiration was when we wrote our UFO sightings desk reference, the best we could do was put all 50 states in there and take them down to about the county level. And we kept having people write us and say, uh, I want to know about my regional area. Okay. And that, that, that was a big driver. The other thing too was um, we had the, the, the desk references were not exactly cheap. They were upwards of like $40. And uh, what we wanted to do was come out with a very affordable book that could literally go down to the county zip code in hamlet level and give you we, we don't give you the sighting data beyond um how many you had so you get a thing where you get down to your particular hamlet and if there were sightings there from any of the shapes it lists out exactly what shapes and across over 20 years going across the page you'll see exactly what those volumes are for both your state and your local area yeah, I can see, you know, people that are just starting into it, uh, maybe even journalists. I thought when the desk reference that came out, it would be a great uh, resource for journalists who are thinking about getting into the subject and want to understand it for their area. But people who are living in Florida maybe don't want a gigantic book that tells them about UFO sightings in some uh, county in Wyoming. This makes sense, though. And I guess uh, how's it going so far? Is it catching on? Uh, yeah, actually, yeah. Every time we get a visibility, like some uh, on a uh, on a, either a major podcast or we had an article, a nice article done uh, by the uh, Detroit Free Press last week, 
and uh, the, the Michigan books went through the roof. <laughs> so uh, it, it, as the word's getting out there, people are, are, are jumping on it. And we've been getting a lot of visibility on Twitter, which has been very good for us as well. Excellent. So uh, the, the goofy thing that, about this, though, is, is that people said, well, why didn't you just print one big book? And it would have been, we figured it out back in 2020, it'd be about <laughs> 6,500 pages. It would have been a foot and a half thick. <laughs> so the idea was let's break it down to the individual states. And even Linda, uh, right up until about um, eight months ago, thought this was an impossible venture. And uh, I applied uh, – I, th- I think my my late uh, uh, methods engineering professor from college would be very proud of this project because I, I came up with a modular way of building these things. And uh, it, it, this has made this possible to j- uh, dump these out at about five a week. You know, there's a guest, a friend of mine named Nick, Nick Redfern, who comes on the show a couple of times a year because he puts out like four books a year. You blow that away. I mean, five books a week is what the, the schedule is. How, how many, where are you now? How many are out and how many are still to go? Uh, as uh, the other day, uh, it was that we had, uh, when we dropped to a note, uh, we had 25 of the states out. Linda took, put five more up there today. Um, we're a little, a little bit ahead of schedule. And right now, unless there's some kind of catastrophe, uh, we expect to have all of them out by no later than the second week of January, probably about the first week of January. Wow. I, I know one of the first editions you put out was for Nevada, and I sure appreciate that. But so much of what's each in, in each volume applies to the big picture, the rest of the country as well as you note in, in a couple of places. So it's, uh, you know, it's not for everyone. Not everyone is happy about mere statistics and facts. Uh, big surprise, right? UFO people upset about something. Can you tell me what which states you chose to go with first and why? Okay, well, the biggest, it was a technical problem to begin with. Uh, the issue was the size of the covers, okay, page counts. Um, that when you printed that, we would have a certain amount of matter in there that is the typical stuff you have to have in the front of the book. And then there was also all the essays that we wrote about our research work. And then a printout, uh, literally uh, down to the village level for every state. Now, some states like North Dakota or something like that, which is kind of at the bottom of the list for sightings, had maybe 14, 15 pages. You get a, a state like California, and it's like over 300. Uh, so and anywhere in between. And so the cover size was an issue. And uh, we originally ranked them based on how big the uh, the printout for their state their state would be. And then we decided to go with Amazon. Instead of designing a separate cover for every state manually, we decided to just go with the automatic covers that they have on Amazon. But we color-coded them. There are four census regions. There's the Northeast, there's the South, there's the Midwest, and their Western uh, census region. So we color-coded the co- covers based on the states in each of those uh, census regions. There's a statement uh, early on in the book where you, you reference that the numbers exist on their own. I mean, they're separate from one's beliefs. That's a tough thing to do in the UFO world, as you know. Yes, very and- much so. Um, it's funny because we've, we, when we were working on uh, the desk reference, before the last desk reference before this one, um, we kept going over to this uh, our local print shop. It actually was like, I think it's Staples. And the guy kept saying, you know, did you take out all the kooks, nuts, and crack pots? And, and I said, you know, how would we do that? We can't vet 167,632 in, in, in our lifespan. So we went with the idea of uh, we have a way of estimating based on percentages of what might be real, what might not be. And uh, the numbers are pretty consistent. We've been hearing people at the Congress saying, you know, like uh, 70 or 80 percent might be um, misidentified and all that kind of thing. And then it gets down to some smaller things that they say they're interested in. And uh, uh, we've run two sets of numbers, one around 30 percent. What, what does that look like? One at one percent. What does that look like? And my favorite is five percent, because that's what feels good to me as to what's really going on. And I'll give you an example. Five uh, percent of the sightings would uh, work out to about uh, 
8,382 for 20 years, and that would be uh, about 35 a month for 240 months for 20 years, and about eight a week, and about one a day. And that's what feels good to me. And what does that tell us? I mean, does that tell us that this is not just uh, something that only pops up once in a while? Even at those numbers, we exclude almost all the cases, right? Yeah, that's true. But you got to look at it. In the United States, the last 20 years, on an average, we average about 8400 a year, about 700 a month, about 160 a week, and an average of about – it spikes now and then, but basically about 23 a day. Um, so for the people who think these things are exceedingly rare, no, we get about 23 a day reports in the United States, and there are many times that the, the, there are spikes all the time. And uh, so there's a lot of activity out there being reported, and we determined that only one in 257 people reports what they see. Right. Uh, and right. <laughs> that was based on a couple of polls that said uh, something like 16.74% of the country uh, of adults uh, say they've seen a UFO. Well, that cranks out, and using 2010 census data, that cranks up to about 43 million people. And so you, you, when you start putting it against 167,000 reported sightings, the, the percentage of people who actually reported what they saw is, is much smaller. Yeah, uh, just think of those numbers, what they must be. I remember 30 years ago, the uh, the essential conclusion of ufologists and UFO groups at the time was 90% of, uh, 9 out of every 10 sightings are probably explainable as prosaic uh, objects uh -huh. or phenomena, but it's also true that 9 out of 10 are not reported at all. So the real numbers could be gigantic. Very true, very true. Um, one of the things we looked at was the idea of uh, we've cranked these numbers a bunch of different ways to see how this works. We tried the old one in 10 type of thing uh, that was used to be talked about. Um, uh, one in 10 people see something and only one in 10 of them reports it. Okay. And we've run the numbers and it, it, it doesn't work. But when we started putting that polling data in there, it, it, it started looking much more reasonable. And then when we put in this factor that we figured out with 150, uh, one in 150, 157, something like that, and uh, the numbers sink right in with what's been reported. So um, there's a lot of stuff going on out there, but a lot of people are not reporting it. And yeah. it's frustrating because we, we would like to have more data. But, you know, we also found out that there was a lot of people who – would go, oh, well, I'm not going to report it to those national centers, or they didn't know that, like, MUFON or New Fork existed. Cheryl Costa, can you explain to us uh, where the raw numbers came from, uh, what databases you put together to come up with the info that's in the book series? Sure. Um, we, we downloaded the information from the National UFO Reporting Center, which accounts for about 60% of the data. And then uh, the Mutual UFO Network, MUFON, was kind enough to uh, support us with uh, a dump of the period of time that we're dealing with, again, 2001 through 2020. And we brought that down. And uh, the, amazingly enough, a lot of people think we've got all the information in there. And the only thing we kept was what, when, where, what state, um, uh, what dates that, and what shape, that type of thing. We just kept the raw data. We didn't keep the stories or anything like that. Right. I know there's a couple of, there's some, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, that's it. There is some feedback that you've got from angry ufologists. Hard to believe that such things exist, right? Uh, angry ufologists who gripe about something, but you received feedback from them like, you know, uh, what are you doing to weed out things that are explainable? So uh, what do you do to sort of Establish these are genuine UFOs that are left in your figures. We we did this percentage thing. Um, right. uh, we had a kind of a rule. Doctor Valet said eighty percent was noise. Uh, Mufon investigators typically told us seventy percent was noise. That type of thing. So we basically said when people ask us if you if you had to eliminate some, uh, what would you do? And I'd say, okay, if you want to go on that standard, we'll say thirty percent is possibly the good is probably the good stuff now and and most people are good with that because it's still a huge number i mean we're talking 30 percent um still amounts to 
50,200 uh, 50, uh, um, for a 20-year period, about 2,500 a year, about 210 a month, every month for 240 months, and about four a week, okay? And um, so this is this is the deal. But, you know, that wasn't good enough for some people. Some people <laughs> said, oh, Cheryl, they've got to be rarer than that. You know, I said, well, how about we throw 99% away and say just keep 1%? And that's where we came up with that number of uh, 1,676 for, uh, uh, average um, for, or actually, for the for 20 years, 84 a year and seven per month. But if that's one percent, that's seven per month for 240 months. I always qualify that those are the real starships visiting the United States every month. So yeah. you know, if people would say, "Well, what's the value of this?" If uh, you know, you've got a, a UFO from 2002 that appeared over Clark County, Nevada. Uh, you don't do any case studies. You're not digging into specifics that would say yes or no, thumbs up, thumbs down about that in particular, that individual yeah. case, right? Right. Well, when Linda and I started out with this, uh, we actually decided to do this stuff back in October 2015. And one of the big complaints both of us had, and I was still writing my newspaper column at the time, was that everything in ufology had been dominated by case studies, okay? And think of case studies as autopsies, okay, like you see on CSI, okay? And Linda came from the Environmental Protection Agency. She's that she's a scientist and worked for them, and she said, we use disease models. So we said, instead of looking at one ant and trying to make a call on this, let's look at the entire ant hill. And that was the approach we took. And we, all we ever set out to do, we weren't out to prove that any one of them is real. We wanted to measure the scale of the phenomena. And that was the objective from the beginning, measure the scale of the phenomena. And uh, learn as a, much as we could about, of, about the sightings, where, where they are, what drives them, what influences them, that type of thing. Yeah, yeah, there's a line early in the book in the foreword, no solitary UFO case exists in a vacuum. And uh, and there's a mention of the context allows uh, the reader to view a UFO sighting as a single thread woven into the fabric of UFO history. That's a pretty cool goal. Yeah, it is. And, you know, another thing people miss on this stuff is uh, there's been a lot of myth out there for uh well they're they're all around the big cities uh, there you go to a big city it's more eyes on the sky people make all these leaps on it and uh, while it looks that way when you first look at the numbers the real truth of the matter is most of the sightings occur in the suburbs the bedroom communities the unincorporated further communities further out and the and the rural communities further out in, with say within a particular uh county uh, that's where the majority, that's seventy five percent of the sightings are reported, and and that's what throws people. And basically, when people ask me questions all the time on this stuff, I'll say, well, okay, to that question, um, the data doesn't support it, uh, and uh, it scares them when you can tell them, you know, the data doesn't support their 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 um, belief or their their um, uh, judgment call based on what they think these things are doing. And, you know, we can't – one of the big questions I get all the time is I get, well, are they hovering around all of our nuclear power plants? Oh, that's good. That's good info. Yeah, right. And right. there's 55 of them. I have the street address and zip code for every one of them. <laughs> and we run the report against them all, and no, they're not. Either the people in that town are not reporting them or uh, they aren't hanging out there. Now – conversation with Lou Alessandro a couple of years ago, we agreed, and again, we're both ex-military people who did analysis work, and basically told me wherever the advanced technology is, aka nuclear weapons. Yeah, they may haunt those bases, and they may haunt where the fleet hangs out, but um, they're not hanging around nuclear power plants, and but they do hang around our toxic waste dumps. Yeah, I thought that was one of the most interesting parts of the book. Uh, toxic waste dumps. Yeah, um, uh, brownfields, uh, strip mines, uh, uh, not every polluted lake, but heavily polluted lakes and rivers. Now, what do you make of that? I mean, that they're interested in our destruction of the earth kind of a thing? 
Yeah, uh, well, if you go and look at the book uh, Beyond UFOs, um, uh, the Dr. Edgar Mitchell Foundation people there, uh, the 4,400 people that they surveyed that were experiencers all came back and said, hey, those folks are great, and they told us to take care of our planet. (laughs) Yeah. So there seems to be a lot of concern about our waste uh, our waste areas. They they follow the toxic areas. They follow follow the um, fault lines. They're really interested in our fault lines and volcanic areas. And um, uh, it's been known for a long time that if you have water, there's more UFO sightings there. Okay, and that is what we call an influencer. Not every place has huge bodies of water, but the places that do have huge bodies of water, it makes a difference. I'll give you an example. People, when we came out with our first desk reference, people said, well, wait a minute. How come Florida has more sightings than Texas? Texas has twice the population of Florida. And um, we pointed out that Florida has 1,200 miles of coastline. Texas has 400. Yeah, so the the implication is maybe that they live in or frequent bodies of water, that that's where they hide, that that's where they fly in and out of. Well, yeah, and, you know, in, when you look at what's going on now in the government, they, they've they been establishing their, these teams to look at the fact that these things can transition from coming in from space, coming through our atmosphere and dive into the water, um, a, a multimedia type of craft. Uh, that that is rattling a lot of people. The government, and as as a, almost a career person myself in the military, I can see why. You know, um, I, yeah. so that's a big deal. That is a big deal. But you know, a lot of people get very upset when they look at some of the influencer stuff and they say to us, "Well, Cheryl, wait a minute. You're saying this is a lot about like human activity as much as the UFOs." And I said, "Yeah, we, we took the position. There just seems to be a lot of UFOs up there." And I'll give an example. Um, back when the December uh, uh, December uh, stuff came out from the New York Times back in 2017, they had that video. And you can still go out to that, that particular article at, at, at the New York Times and get that video. But you look at that video. Don't look at the video. Listen to what the pilots are saying. And one of them says, hey, I got that one. Let's track that. And then suddenly you hear, Wow. There's a whole fleet of them, not a single major news organization, uh, CNN, all of those people. They always cut it off before that part of the audio track came, right. came along. Well, part, you know, those are part of the cover up as anybody. It's seagulls, right? <laughs> and that, oh, yeah, that what yeah. It is? Yeah. Yeah. Seagulls. Yeah. Um, you know, you make a distinction. Let me let me go back to Nevada. So, uh, thankfully, okay. one of the first ones you put out was Nevada, my home state, and which well, I really I did appreciated. That for you, I did oh, that for you. All right. Well, good. I I appreciate it. But you make the distinction that you know. I think Nevada is ranks number twenty four. How, uh-huh. how much of that is a function of our population? And also, you know, we don't have any coastline to speak of. But you make a distinction between Nevada and Arizona. There are other reasons why those two states might uh, rank higher than their population might indicate. Yeah, there is there is some differences. Uh, you do have your Area 51 in, in, uh, up there, and it's not so much about the alien stuff there as much as they test a lot of stuff. Yeah. Okay? Right. And uh, so you've got a lot of uh, a lot of goofy stuff in the air out there. But, um, but you also have the desert environment, and that makes a big difference. That, 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 I, I used to come out to Vegas twice, twice a year. Um, my, uh, Linda used to own a fabric store, and we came out there for, the, for buying things. And we were always out there how clear the sky is at night, even with the, the, the light pollution downtown. As soon as you get away from the downtown light pollution, you've got a pretty clear sky. So there's, uh, the desert areas seem to have a little bit better window on, on this stuff. To be able to see it. What's interesting about Nevada is, uh, uh, in 20 years, they averaged about 2,200 a year. About, I'm sorry, about 2,280 over the 20 years. About 1,400. Uh, I'm sorry, 114 a year. About 10 a month and about uh, two a week. And you're able to break it down. For example, you factor into into your numbers things like when the clubs uh, let out, when a lot of people are outside, right? Oh yeah. Um, if if you remember, I mentioned that like uh, 75, 80% happens between uh, sightings 
are reported between about 7 o'clock at night and about 11 o'clock at night. Okay. But, uh, and then it falls off pretty steep after midnight. But, and, and then you see a bump at 5 o'clock in the morning. Now, some places you see a bump at 3 o'clock in the morning. I'll get back to that in a minute. But in, in Clark County, or for that matter, in just in Nevada itself, but we narrow it down to Clark County, there was a bump at 1, a bump at 2, and a bump at 4. And I sent that out to an investigator out there, and she came back and we said, well, that's when the clubs and the shows let out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you got to be outside. Okay, one, hours of darkness and leisure time. You've got to be able to be outside. So how often? We found it in some of the southern states. Uh, the, the hot day for the sightings were like on Wednesday or Thursday. We didn't know why. Uh, and then some interns that were working for Linda looked at that and said, well, we're from down south. That's Bible study night. You know, so, okay, people are out. They come back from Bible study. They're on the parking lot. Hey, honey, look at that. You know, <laughs> that kind of thing. You know, it's Yeah, simple. you factor in things like uh, when people are walking their dogs, when they're ending the night by going out, stepping outside to smoke a cigarette, the last cigarette of the night. That's when a lot of people see things in the sky. Yeah, you know, and the MUFON investigators will tell you, I, I've talked to MUFON investigators uh, that have told me, uh, literally the guys who teach that kind of class, have told me that uh, they'll they'll get a month's worth of sightings for their state, and they'll run a text file search on smoke or dog, on the idea that uh, smoking hmm. dog walkers are, and dog wa- smokers and dog walkers are, are people who are outside. They're rather reliable. They know the lay of their local land. They know what's normal and what's not, that type of thing. And how many people have we ever heard about, they, they're out there walking the dog, and the, the dog stopped got stiff and started growling and there there's the ufo you know that type of thing many many reports that i wrote that stories about you know for nevada of course the the two biggest counties are also they rank one and two the biggest in terms of population rank one and two in terms of the overall sightings not a surprise but population isn't the only factor as you look at beyond nevada and other rural areas i mean the, it, the distribution of these cases and incidents is uh, astounding, really. There, I think there's a yeah. hundred and some counties that you found didn't have cases, but that's really a function. Hundred and five, hundred and five right? of uh, about thirty one hundred thirty five counties in the United States, and that shifts a little bit because states sometimes combine them and sometimes generate a new one or whatever. But basically, about thirty one hundred thirty five, and about one hundred and five did not report UFOs in twenty years. And we know which ones they are. They're mostly rural and they're mostly poor. That means they don't have broadband. <laughs> right. And that, that is also a driver. Let me give you. Let me give you the drivers real quick for your audience. Sure. Yes. Population, temperate weather, the, the weather patterns for us to see them up in northern states is different than what it is in a middle level state going like from about Maryland going over that type of thing. And then uh, leisure time. Hours of darkness and observer access to broadband. Brand. These were the major drivers. Now, the influencers, not every place has this proximity to water, proximity to toxic environments, toxic, uh, to- proximity to geological faults, high media reports, and what we call the generational effect. And that kind of accounts for Los Angeles County and Maricopa County, Arizona that are the number one and number two counties in the country for sightings. In fact, the number one zip code in the country is 85001. I'll say that again, 85001, and that is downtown Phoenix. And in 20 years, they had 1,374. The next closest county is only about 700. Okay, so something really special goes on in Maricopa County, but in downtown Phoenix. But even that number, I've had producers call me up and say, hey, we want to go someplace. There's a hot spot where we can, you know, set up the cameras and just wait, sit there and wait for them. You know, even then, it's only five or six a month. You know, There's a distinction you make in the book, uh, in the Nevada book that I read, uh, about UFO versus IFO. And I recall Project Blue Book, which was trying to whitewash the whole thing, was still left with 701 unidentified genuine UFOs. But the actual number, as you write, could be three times that much. Why is that? Easily. easily. Um, well, I I don't know how to explain that. Um, the The numbers are huge. 
Okay, but we have to discount the fact that, and every news director I've ever talked to or editor will tell me, well, you, you, you don't have all the credible observers. They don't huh. trust everybody. But my argument to a lot of people is somebody says, well, I, I don't believe they're out there. I said, well, I got 167,632 eyewitness accounts. <laughs> An eyewitness account can still get you convicted in any court in the country if you don't have CSI evidence. <laughs> yeah. That's right. We're talking with Cheryl Costa about this amazing series of UFO books. Great idea for a Christmas present for the UFO aficionado and your family. Uh, depending on where you live, the, the uh, more than half of the state's issues are already out, 30 of them so far and more on the way. Cheryl Costa, I thought one of the most interesting aspects of the work that you've done in this book series is the uh, emphasis on exotic shapes uh, and and how you use that to sort of differentiate what what might be legit, uh, a legitimate mystery and unknown, and what is it? Can you explain what shapes you included uh, and which ones are the most common? Well, first thing, for this uh, state series, we, we did um, all, all the shapes were included. Okay, we took the whole, the whole raw number set. Um, but uh, when we talk about the exotic shapes, uh, Linda made a big point. This is back when I was writing my column uh, a number, about five years ago. The shapes seem to be telling, very telling, uh, because it's, there's a cycle of about every six or seven years. It goes up and goes down. And, and we've got a 60-year 60 60 plot in the desk reference that shows they go up and down, up and down, up and down. And... Uh, People have always ask us, well, why does it go down like that? I said, we really don't know, but Linda's conjecture, and the thing is, they've gone back to their home world or wherever to, to get the latest model vehicle. Now, back <laughs> in the day, we, you know, back in the what, 40s and 50s, it was all flying saucers. These days, it's all triangles or big spheres, that type of thing. So uh, there's that. that. The exotic shapes tell you an awful lot about um, the diversity. Think about this. There's like 28 shapes out there, okay, that we know about. Uh, some are variations. Uh, there's all, upwards of 80, but most of them are, are variations of these 28 shapes. And um, it's like when you look at a car. A car, you know, is four wheels, you know, windows, that type of thing. But you can tell the difference between an American car and an Italian car. Or, or a Japanese car in most cases, okay? It seems to be the technology of the craft was designed by a different species of people. It's what it seems to be. And well, so many, of the, 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 so many of the shapes that you, you reference that are cited in the books are not exactly aerodynamic. I mean, you know about the current controversy on uh, flying pyramids, uh, there's yeah. also these spheres inside cubes. If you're trying to do something that's what we would consider aerodynamic, a sphere in a cube is not it, right? No, it's not. And that's the goofy thing. Um, there's another one. You interviewed uh, Dr. Belay about this uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, he was talking about change, the, the shapes that appear to change. Yeah. Okay. Right. And there's two there's two look, two ways to look at that. Either it's a living ship with ai capability that can that has that can telepathically tell us it looks like something else and goes you know beams into our brain because remember our brain processes things our eyes perceive the brain processes so it's either telling us it looks like something else or they've got a stealth technology that any country in this world would would, would love to have you know that's that's the key to yeah. it there some people speculate they're living organisms that they you know they change shapes uh, based on maybe not necessarily because of aerodynamics or something but because for our benefit you know as a display of some sort uh i've been of that opinion for some time again it, it's a whole different topic for a different show but sure. consciousness seems to be a major factor here too because a lot of these ships they seem to know when we're looking at them. Right. You know, and I've read report after report. When we noticed it, it, suddenly it decided to dart off. But you know what's funny, though? In the last 20 years, uh, we from 19, people asked me when we wrote our first book, 
back in 2017, they ask us, you know, why didn't you go back 40 years? There's this perception that 40 years ago was the golden age of UFOs. And 1960 to 2000 added up to 15,150 sightings between both databases of reported sightings. I've got 15,000 with 2011, 2012, and 2013 each year. So if Hmm. that was the golden age, baby, we are in the platinum age or diamond age. Now, 21st (laughs) century, we have more sightings than the last 60 years. You, you, I recall the last time you were here, we were talking about COVID and the effect of COVID, where a lot of people were at home. You know, they're not working. They're not going to the office. They're at home with time on their hands. What was the overall effect of that looking back now? March and April were through the roof in 2020. We couldn't tell until until, until we got into um, uh, May, June time frame when we could get the data. But um, uh, March and April during the primary lockdown, uh, the, the numbers went through the roof. And the rest of the numbers for the year were uncharacteristic. It seemed to cycle with the, the what, what, what was the, uh, Dr. Fauci and those other people talked about, oh, the wa- different, wa- different waves of infection. Right. And that type of thing. It, they seemed to fluctuate with that. It was, it was intriguing to look at. You you make, mention in the book, you know, there are obviously a lot of data. We've learned a lot. We do not learn, for example, where they're from. We don't know how they managed to get here. We don't know why they're here, what their goal is, what their interest is in us. So the big, big kind of questions. What do we learn from these numbers? What's the useful lesson that people take away from looking at the, all the data that you've crammed into these books? Um, broad strokes. The broad stroke. They're right. every, just except for 105 counties, they're every place in the United States. And if you want to extrapolate that further, uh, probably every place in the world. Uh, I get re- I get requests all the time from from Europe, from Asia, from Canada, asking me why haven't you crunched our numbers? And I told them I specialize in the USA, you know. But uh, th- there are people doing this work and uh, trying to follow in our footsteps. So. We'll see. But you know what we do need is right now we've got two civilian reporting agencies. And it really would be nice if a major government agency took this seriously and began being that 800 number type of thing so that you could report this stuff. And it goes into a a massive public database to really get the numbers. Because a lot of people didn't, didn't, when I wrote my column, a lot of people didn't know MUFON or New Fork existed. Right. Any chance of uh, audio book versions of this? I mean, it's a lot of numbers to read, I suppose. No, <laughs> we, toyed, we toyed with that. Um, we get, we keep getting requests for electronic for the electronic book. The, the 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 tables and things like this don't translate well uh, into into the Kindle format. Oh, by the way, all the all these uh, state books are available on Amazon. Uh, we've established a series. The series is called UFO Scholar State Statistics Series. That's the official series number. We got, we got a, a, the official statistics, uh, not statistics, the official uh, series uh, uh, number established with Amazon. Um, the names of the book, the, they're all named the same thing, uh, except UFOs in Ohio and where to find them, UFOs in Nevada and where to find them. It'll be UFOs in California and where to find them, you know. At, can people order the books that are not yet published? No, no. Uh, uh, right now, like I said, we've only got 30 up there, um, and uh, it might be 35 to, by, by about noon tomorrow, East Coast time. It should be 35. Um, and that's they can order those they can order those ones but uh, we haven't pu- we haven't published the other ones yet uh, we, we have a very very tight quality control process and uh, we have to take even though we're putting them out pretty fast we have a very very tight process for how we're doing things and we follow process a we're former contractors you know you'd follow you do <laughs> everything to process you, you make an interesting uh, distinction about California. Of course, that's the the big Megilla. It's number one in, in the total number of sightings. It's number one in population. But you break it down into, I mean, California can practically be three or four states in one and so yeah. many different environments and so many different kinds of communities. Talk about California as a 
uh, as an example? Well, 17, I'm sorry, 21,000 over the 20 years of uh, 2001 to 2020. Um, and it, it's funny, it's a little less in Northern California, but California has like three different, uh, represents three, it's got all that coastline. It also has um, the, the temperate patterns up in the north like you would have up in New England. It has the temperate patterns in the south like you would have in Florida or Texas. And the middle part of the state around San Francisco is like going across the country from, you know, Virginia and the Carolinas across to California. It's it's it represents everything. It is like three or four different states by itself. But a lot of people knee jerk and say the population in, in California, that's the driver. Well, we took a similar we did an experiment on the East Coast, similar um, um, a coastal a coastal area, similar land mass, and uh, and a similar size population, and actually the the, the pseudo California and East Coast actually had more uh, more sightings than California did. Okay, so the, California is its own animal, and, and, and you, you can't compare it to any of the other states. You really can't. But uh, a lot of goofy stuff goes on there. Los Angeles County is the hottest county in the country for, for UFO sightings. They've got more sightings than 39 individual states. Uh, Maricopa County, Arizona, you know, Phoenix Lights, all that kind of thing, uh, has more had more sightings than uh, 36 individual states. So those are the two county hot spots in the country. I thought you make an interesting point about media influence. That's the old chestnut, right? Is the, you know, the people that don't want this to be true or to be taken seriously, they'll say, oh, this is just really a reaction to media reports. It's like Kenneth Arnold's sighting happens and suddenly there's reports uh, all over the country about UFOs. And it's really a reaction to news stories as opposed to actual events. What do you, what's your take on that? Okay. Yeah. That was something I, I, I noted back when I read and saw the Ken, uh, Ken Arnold stuff originally, okay? And suddenly, if you're reading the New York Times back in that era, um, they're talking about, hey, they had them coming in, calling people, calling the Associated Press. They were come, being reported in 38, 38 states, that type of thing. All right. And Blue Book even mentioned this. In fact, we got that idea from Blue Book, uh, the idea of media reports. But what we've observed, and we were able to observe this with a National UFO Reporting Center, give an example. Um, Indiana is a state that averages maybe about two sightings a week. Okay, in 2008, on April 16th, they had 25 in one day. Okay, it came to be called the Kokomo Lights. Now, if you watch the National UFO Reporting Center data. After those, after that first couple of days in local reporting, none of it bubbled up to the national wires, but it was all local reporting. And if you watch, there was a fallout period over the next five or six days and of, of sighting reports. But when we looked at the sighting reports, it was like there must have been an article in the paper that said, hey, people report these things to MUFON or New Fork, that type of thing. And it seemed to be retro reporting. It was just like, seemed to be this, oh, maybe I should report that one I had two months ago or that one I had two years ago. And when people hear they have their place to report this stuff, they tend to go back and do these retro reporting type of things. That's what we discovered. Huh. Um, there could so, be copycats in there, but this is, the, this is what the data is showing us. I know there was something in there about triangle shapes that, was, that you had to give some special consideration to triangles, worrying that there was, you know, people are seeing something like the TR3B, which may or may not exist. Can you talk about that for a moment? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I've had every time I wrote an article about triangles and I've seen one of the big ones, it's like a football field long, two stories, two, three stories deep. I've seen one of those and it would take your breath away. And it, and it, it, people tell me it's a TR3B, and I'm going, um, yeah. If we've got something, if that if that football field long, two or three stories deep thing is uh, something we've got in development as a taxpayer, I'd like to know more about it. You know, <laughs> that was my attitude on it. But um, there, 
there there may be some it, we just saw an, a, the, some kind of b21 bomber just they just started showing us it's awfully saucer shaped if you know what it's, know what i mean there yeah but that idea of saucer shaped aircraft has been around since the 1940s they were developing it they found out that there were turbulent problems um, by having prop driven engines on each side of the saucer Okay, it made it a very unwieldy thing. I saw a documentary on, on the PBS a couple of years ago, and um, it only started seeing it again in development once they got jet engines that didn't cause the same kinds of turbulence. Okay, so, you know, there's still a lot of interesting technology we're, we're playing with, especially in the stealth technology type of things. Um, it, it, it's anybody's guess. We can make it. A lot of the um, chevron-shaped, um, uh, triangular chevron-shaped type UFOs could easily be a B-1 bomber, okay? It sure. could easily be a B-1 or a B-2 bomber. Or now B-21, B-21, I guess. Maybe. Or B-21, yeah. So um, any, it could be any of these things. There's a lot of stuff out there in development. Um, I don't have an open door into into those areas where they're developing this stuff. And no, I did not. When I worked for Lockheed Martin for 32 years. I did not work at Skunk Works. Okay. I was an IT person for most of my career. Early in my career, I produced industrial films. So I've had people pestering me on um, Twitter saying, hey, when they pass this this uh, whistleblower thing there, are you going to come clean? That's <laughs> just uh-huh. for me to come clean about. Oh, come on. You know what I building they're stashed in. Stuff. Pardon me? You know, you know what building they're stashed in, right? I'm, I'm kidding. Uh, no, I I'm don't. About this. <laughs> right. I don't have a clue. We're trying to get um, uh, take one quick call before we have we have to go to a break in about a, a minute or so. But I think Cornelius on the wild card line can ask something uh, that you can answer in a minute. Hi, Cornelius. Hey, George. I wanted to tell you, I, I tried to email you and stuff. I'm the one uh, with the FBI and stuff like that. They falsely accused. But for your uh, guest. Um, I live here in El- in Alexandria, Louisiana. We used to have England Air Force Base here. Then we got Barksdale in Shreveport, and we got Fort Polk in uh, Leesville, Louisiana. So has have anybody made any sightings from these different military bases? And also, George, I wanted to tell you. I, I, Cornelius, we're going to a break here in 30 seconds, so I'm going to let uh, Cheryl answer your question, and then you just hang on, and we'll get back to you. Uh, Cheryl, I can't tell you about I can't tell you about bases, but uh, Louisiana over 20 years had 13, uh, 14, about 1,400 uh, sightings, and they had about they average about 69 a year and about uh, five a month down there. Uh, we're going to go uh, we're going to go west of the Rockies. Neil in Pittsburgh, California. Hi, Neil. What's on your mind? Hello, George. Hello, and thank you for a great show. And uh, I had a couple questions for Cheryl. Sure. Uh, the first, the first one is, is there a correlation between UFO sightings and Bigfoot sightings? And the second question is, is there a lot of sightings? Seem to be a, a lot of sightings along the 39th parallel. And a big hello to Kanye Willis and Blue Rock Talkers. All right. Hey, um, uh, so Cheryl, you did look at, for example, the UFO highway, that 39th parallel story that's been around, and you uh, and. Uh... What did you find? Um, the, the book that came out in 2016 called it the UFO Superhighway. And uh, when we, in 2020, we put all the lat longitudes in into our database. And basically, there were 12 other latitudes in the United States that had far more sightings than that particular one. Would you call them hotspots? Um, they went through heavily populated areas, right. okay, and the, the, the you know the, they just happened to be into the bigger industrial areas. One of the problems with that um, super highway one was when you we were working on the first book, and we didn't have time to look at it, but our gut instinct was that it was that latitude was going through a lot of southern states. There weren't a lot of there wasn't a lot of stuff down there. And where it picked up all of its real serious numbers were when they went through a major city or something like this. You would think a UFO superhighway would have, you know, consistent numbers going across the country. And we found that with some of the other latitudes. 
Neil was asking about a co uh, a coincidental uh, connection to Bigfoot sightings. I know you don't look at Bigfoot sightings. I wonder if you've ever thought about putting a map of that kind of stuff over a, a UFO map and seeing if there's a uh, connection. The problem is, is uh, okay. We have a we have a little poster up here in the in the in the office here, and it says just because you want a statistic doesn't mean it exists. <laughs> Uh, the, the deal yeah. there is is that uh, we uh, we wanted to do it against um, uh, livestock mutilations. Every oh, state's yeah. got it, yeah. okay, not just the western states. But uh, there was nobody had a consistent database of all of that. Same thing goes for Bigfoot sightings. Um, I've gone to a couple of conferences where Bigfoot, uh, Bigfoot Sasquatch type stuff was mentioned uh, and had several speakers. And I talked to the people who were there, had books, that type of thing, and they, they, nobody had compiled such a thing. While right. there's tons of sighting reports out there, nobody had really compiled it. So there was nothing, there was nothing for me to put into the database to compare it to. All right, Bigfoot folks who are listening, somebody get to work on this. The, the, the challenge has been issued. Neil, thanks for that call. We're going to go to the wild card line, Bill in Los Angeles. Hey, Bill, how you doing? Hi, George and Cheryl. Hey, I understand from uh, the History Channel that Catalina Island off the coast of L.A. here has been a hot spot for USOs, including uh, recorded 911 calls to law enforcement. Um, Cheryl, does do your data distinguish between USOs and UFOs in Los Angeles County, and can you put to rest the the debunkers' stale claim that drones can account for what these craft do? <laughs> okay, um, okay, okay. First thing for Catalina Island, there's a number of sighting reports that are in the database uh, calling out Catalina Island. Okay, not a huge number, but there are, it's been reported over the years. Um, USOs. There are almost none of the database entries that we looked at called out U, uh, USOs. I, I think there's maybe in all of the data we looked at, there's maybe three that referenced the USO kind of environment. Um, so, you know, that's that's all there is. If the data's not there, there's no way to uh, do any work on it. Uh, yeah, that would be that would be tough to get tough info to get. What about the uh, what about the other question on the drones? Can you differentiate drones. there? Okay, well, okay. There's a couple of things on that. Um yeah, some people could have um misidentified, but we saw some news reports here a couple of months ago saying there was all Chinese drones. Yeah, right. Nah, 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 nah. nah. I'm not <laughs> I'm not buying that. Not Okay, hey, you're talking to an ex-sailor who been hundreds of miles out in the ocean, thousands of miles out in the ocean, and have somebody say, hey, we had 150 of these things floating around this ship. Where is the control capability for that? Okay, you have to look at that. Yeah, maybe they're sitting, maybe the, a whole bunch of Chinese guys are sitting there, each one with their own little control box there, <laughs> sitting on top of a submarine or something like that. Yeah, maybe. But um, I was in submarines. There's not an awful lot of room on top of a submarine for a lot of people to be standing around. So I, I, I discount that whole thing. Oh, you don't think that there are super duper drones that can fly a couple of hundred miles out to ocean and just zip around? And, you know, you could probably buy those at Walmart, don't you think? Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. You know, right. I was <laughs> walking through the park about two weeks ago before it got really cold here. And uh, we were walking along in the park and all of a sudden we could hear this drone coming by, a little, little drone. All of a sudden we heard it go, <laughs> and it hit a tree and <laughs> literally fell about 10 feet from us. You know, so, yeah, there's lots of drones out there, but uh, I, I the, the the ones that have to go out there, they, uh, the, the battery time on these things is less than 30 minutes in most cases. Unless they've made some big leap in battery technology, no, I don't think they can do that. We're going to Norm in St. Louis, Missouri. Hi, Norm. You're on with Cheryl Costa. Oh, qu quick uh, questions or comments. Uh, I live in uh, St. Louis. I live by uh, Lambert Air airport most of my life 63 years but uh so i know where planes fly you know 40,000 feet but back i want to say it was uh 2016 me and my son were out uh all night from like midnight till four in the morning 
Uh, it was a really big meteor shower, and they were coming like one every 30 seconds, the most I've ever seen in my life. But somewhere between 2 and 3 in the morning, uh, going west to east, and I want to say like three or four times higher than uh, where commercial planes go. And, you know, like we had seen 100 commercial planes up in here, and uh, these were three or four times higher. But they, they were flying really erratic, like super fast, stop, go left, go right, stop, go. And they went west to east. And then my, uh, I guess enough, my last comment would be, uh, as far as I, I'm like a, what I would say, an open-minded Christian. So that I think this is my theory is uh, – they're benevolent, whether they're angels or whatever you want to call them. Maybe Jesus has another planet somewhere with people, but uh, I don't know. But I'm just saying I think they, God sends them to intervene when man's ready to self-destruct. <laughs> That's an interesting thought. I don't think there's anything in UFO data that conflicts with religious beliefs, Christian beliefs at all. Uh, uh, Cheryl, you want to tackle that uh, question? And, and his reference about the 2016 meteor shower. Um, okay, uh, I, I can't talk about the meteor shower. I, I don't have any data on that. I don't follow that that much. Um, as far as the religious beliefs, I have talked to. Uh, I am technically clergy myself. I'm in boot. Uh, I'm a Buddhist clergy, and uh, I've talked to many, many uh, uh, Christian clergy who have told me that they have had of former fighter pilots and things like this come in and confess in under the seal of confession um these things that they chase when they were fighter pilots that they couldn't catch hmm. so it, it um, most people that i talk to believe that there is, what is the, what is the statement um uh, my father's house has many uh, has many rooms yeah. the universe is a big place and if god created it as 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 we think then uh, the, the the universe is permeated with life well put thanks for the call norm uh, first time caller joe in texas uh, welcome to coast to coast joe you're on with Cheryl costa Hey, I just wanted to uh, kind of give you a, a UFO story that I had since I was a kid. It was um, 1998. I was playing outside of my grandmother's house. It was a, um, a cul-de-sac. It was me, my sister, and a friend of ours were all out playing. It was a late afternoon. And out of these woods at the end of the cul-de-sac comes flying this, uh, this UFO. Now, the UFO was five-sided triangle. So I had flat sides, but it was, a, it was a triangle shape. And it freaked out my sister and my, my buddy so bad they ran back to my grandmother's house, started beating on the door to have them be let in. Now, mind you, George, I'm only about 100 yards from this thing. And I'm looking up at it, and I'm, I'm, I'm amazed. My grandmother comes to the door, and she's like, like, Joey, come back. That's just a helicopter. Well, it was no helicopter because as it was flying, it came to a stop. And for about 30 to 45 seconds, I'm looking at this thing. And it's got white lights, like, like a string of pearls on the side, and an undulating-type opal green color sphere on the bottom. And I, it just burned into my memory. And after about 30 seconds, it just takes off with no sound. And it was just kind of crazy. I just kind of wanted to share that with you guys. Yeah, helicopter with no sound. I, uh, Cheryl... Uh... Thanks for sharing the story, Joe. Cheryl, is there? I didn't see audio info. Do you get that typically in in UFO reports that come your way? Uh, I well, okay. In the in the data, if you look at the databases that raw from MUFON or raw from National UFO Reporting Center, yeah, you do see those. I saw that a lot when I was writing my column. Uh, the different people, different people uh, heard. Uh, um, um, a buzzing sound or something that sounded like a uh, the, the the kind of sound you used to get on a on a tele a, a landline phone when you picked it up and there was a dial tone that kind of a sound I've heard it described that way. Uh, thanks for the call. Uh, we got uh, let's go to Carl in the Bronx on the wild card line. Hey Carl, good morning. You're all Michelle Costa. Good morning, George, George and and um, Cheryl. Thank you for taking my call. <clears throat> I'm very happy to. I've, I've been on your show many many times, and and I have a very critical question. Um, 
they has Cheryl has to dedicate a book to the contactees, to the to the alien races that are coming here. We must find out from the contactees whether if Russia launches tactical nuclear weapons, will the will the alien races uh, intervene? They can render these weapons useless. They have been over. Uh, they've been over all our bases, and they they can turn off all our weapons to useless weapons. They must intervene because if they don't intervene, the dead, the, the, the living, will be jealous of the dead. We must find out. He must that he must get in touch with all the contactees. I tell you what, Carl. I'm not sure that that's uh, that would be a tough. Tough nut to crack there in trying to figure that out from statistics on UFO uh, sightings. Interesting point, but Cheryl, would you like to respond to that? Yeah, I can talk to that. Um, uh, I was actually approached by um, Steve Bassett. He's our um, our lobby, one of our major lobbyists down in D.C., and he approached me a few years ago after the first book came out, and he asked me if if we could do a thing, do the same thing. Uh, gathering the data and working the statistics for experiences. The problem was that there was nobody been keeping a database. Okay, and one of the things we did try to do is we tried to reach out to Whitley Strieber um, because him and his wife, after communion, got upwards. Uh, I the, the high number was upwards of two hundred thousand letters right. from experiences. Right, right, and right. Uh, that would have been very nice. Uh, unfortunately. That data is uh, is all now archived at uh, Rice uh, Rice University, and um, uh, unless I, unless somebody gave me a, a good grant to go and go do this, um, I, I, there's no way. I, I'd love to go 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 to that archive. Not that I want to out anybody. Just get like dates, times when people say they saw things. Um, I'd love to go do that, um, but I, I I would need a grant. As as it is, all of our data books. And our desk references and all this whole series of books we're doing was financed by the pensions of two old ladies. Oh, well, uh, maybe we could talk Jeff Krypal into assigned in grad students to do that work and you could help them. But uh, thanks to all our callers. I want to ask you one other question uh, before we go, Cheryl. I saw something, I think it was on social media this past week uh, that you had written about a column. The only column you ever wrote for that paper that you worked for as a columnist the only one that was ever spiked. What was that? What was it? Okay. Um, it was in 2016, and I wrote an article. Understand, I'd been writing a column for three years at that point. And uh, the article was, what will disclosure look like? And I described this, you know, if, if we get to have our, our, our government leadership come out and say, you know, uh, you know, the president and the vice president come on TV, they got the joint chiefs with them, they got the leaders of uh, the two houses of Congress, and they say, hey, we, we've, we've been in touch with a space faring waste, you know, that, 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 that's real, you know. And uh, the, then the rest of the article, I says, how will that change us? Think about it from an anthropologist viewpoint. Um, it's going to, suddenly these these off worlders, if they're introduced to any of them, are going to be the darlings. They're going to be on Good Morning America and all these <laughs> sorts of things. You know, we're going to have reconciliation meetings with Travis Walton and Whitley Strieber on national television, and all saying, "Hey, you know, no hard feelings, all this kind of <laughs> stuff." And I, I wrapped up the the. Uh, it's got really snarky. We're going to be. It's going to affect our fashions. All this stuff. And then the last thing I put on there was the late night uh, was the script for a late night uh, ambulance chasing lawyer saying you know, <laughs> due to a, a recent a recent treaties with uh, with the Galactic Federation, if you lost a job previously lost a job due to reporting a UFO hit, livestock mutilations, or uh, lost your air, uh, pilot's license, and yeah. like call our firm. You're going to be due for a financial compensation. You know? Yeah, this could be bigger than Camp Lejeune. You know the lawsuits yeah, anyway. Exactly. Uh, Cheryl. Cheryl Costa, congratulations to you and Linda on this uh, terrific project. Best of luck. We have links on our Coast to Coast website if people want more information, and I hope you sell a million of these things. We hope we hope so, too. Uh, the, the, thing, the reason they spiked it, 
they felt I had established such gravitas ah. with the column for three years. They thought it was below me. <laughs> oh, I suppose I have a sense of humor about this stuff. Thanks again, Cheryl. Appreciate it. We'll talk Thank to you, you soon. Bye bye right. now. The Coast Mobile app is now available for download on iPhones and Android devices. You can become an insider directly through this app. This is a great option for our international listeners, and new users will also receive a free two-week trial.